Oh, hey there guys, it's Mike from Evident. You've probably seen our stuff before and wondered, what the f is Evident? What do we do? Well, that's a great question. Our main job is dental CAD design. Still wondering what makes Evident so special? Well, the best labs and dentists choose Evident to turn their scans into bridges, crowns, aligners, and veneers, and more every single day. Be more than just a number. We'll build a cat team around you to make your digital dental treatments better by design. Go digital with the cool kids, start rolling with Evident, and let's get the digital party Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, for the folks in the UK, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my name is Paolo Kalau. I'm the CEO of Evident. And uh, it's a privilege this morning to have with me one of the most unique and accomplished uh, individuals I know in the UK, and Dr. Prem Palsemi. Uh, did hey, I say that that's right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the one. <laughs> What an introduction, oh, thank and, you. It's a privilege to be here. <laughs> you know, I was reflecting. I mean, we've never met in person, but we've only conversed online. It's like a, 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 an online friendship, and I don't think I've ever run into you through my travels. No, it's been, uh, I think I've been uh, trying to get you to adopt me for the last 10 years, maybe. <laughs> I think it's been at least 10 years, 9 to 10 years, um, and, uh, so unsuccessfully so far, but, you know, let's see what the future holds. Huh? <laughs> well, it, and it goes to show how good your marketing campaigns are, because I found out about you all the way from uh, the UK to Vancouver, and I actually <laughs> follow some of your your ads. I mean, there's a camel somewhere. There's, yeah, there's you know, there's the hills. Camels. There's. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think uh, maybe for the audience to understand and and get the feel for who you are, uh, just give us a bit about your history. I mean, you're obviously in the UK. Whereabouts uh, in the UK are you? I'm in Leeds in the UK, which is um, the best bit of the UK, um, obviously. And it's uh, North, North England, North England. Very good. Too cold for you guys. We don't get the snow you guys get, but it, it's cold and it rains a lot, but it's a fantastic place to live. And uh, tell us a bit about your background. I mean, you're a dentist, you're a lab owner, you're an entrepreneur, and not just in, in you know, terms of smaller operations, but everything you do seems to be super sized. So maybe a bit of history about how you ended up in the dental business and and kind of the things you've done over the last few years would, sure. would give the audience an appreciation for who you are. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I, I'm 41 years old now. Um, I wanted to become a dentist because it actually increases your standing in the Indian community such that when you have an arranged marriage, you get um, introduced to a far more attractive wife when you've got a doctorate in front of your name. So I thought, right, first thing we're going to do is get a doctorate. And uh, I progressed down the path of becoming a dentist. So I did my five years at university. I went to Birmingham. Absolutely fantastic time. Lots of drinking, lots of rugby, uh, very little actually to do with teeth. And then I graduated and I found that um, I, I was uh, struggling in the real world of dentistry. I have very, very large hands. People have very small mouths. It was an incredibly short career. I did four and a half years as a clinical dentist. Um, I, I wasn't actually very good at it. Um, it was a really poor career choice from uh, the practical aspects. And um, it was a, a short and extremely litigious career. So the dentists in the UK now, Pay less indemnity because I no longer practice, so that's a, that's a, a hell of fun for you. Um, but I, no, I I, very, I started buying dental practices initially because uh, 
they, they were very well priced. You know, this is 12 years ago in the UK and you could get a dental practice for one year's profit. It was a phenomenal way to earn money. Yeah. So I, yeah, I began buying practices um, and then we were approached by a corporate group who said, um, look, you know, we want to set up a dental laboratory to service our, we had then several hundred dental practices. And I said, what do you know about laboratory work? I knew nothing about laboratory work at that point, apart from what I knew in practice. But obviously when somebody's asking me and they've got 400 practices, um, I obviously told this gentleman that I was the world's leading expert on dental laboratories, the formal sultan of, uh, of, of laboratory work on the planet. And um, it ended up that we uh, we ended up getting uh, work outsourced. So we were one of the, not the first labs, there was a lab that had done it several years before us, but it, it wasn't very common to outsource your work. So we outsourced the work to a lab in China and uh, and, and off we went. And um, the prices were obviously incredibly competitive around half the price of the UK market. And just for you guys over in the, the other side of the pond, um, the UK market was and still is very much based on the uh, PFM crown, the bonded crown. So although we do have obviously your Emacs and your Zirconia, even now, I would say oh, 75 to 80% of the work is still bonded work. It's still porcelain fused to metal crown. So we set off doing the laboratory, the, the laboratory grew very quickly because of the prices and to be honest, the quality coming out of um, you know the Chinese laboratories was actually phenomenal. It was very, very good. They'd already started embracing technology. There was some element of um, sort of milling and uh, sorry, rudimentary, you know, digital work being done. So these guys were good. You know, they were they were ahead of the curve. Um, so that was the laboratory, and then I went on from there to open a training academy for dentists. And again, in the UK, it wasn't very widespread. If you wanted to run a course in the UK sort of eight or nine years ago, you had to book a university. A university would charge you maybe three or four thousand pounds a day. So I set up a training academy. Yeah, it was expensive. So we had um, 20 room phantom heads uh, with all nice digital station, um, a lecture theatre, working surgeries uh, and a room for techniques. So this was kind of first of its size, I believe, in the UK. And that was really successful. That went really well. We're doing a lot of courses, a lot of training. And obviously, when you're in touch with that many people, other opportunities arise. So then I got the opportunity to do the um, quick straight teeth, because quite honestly, we saw the worldwide success of six month smiles. Um, you know, they were doing phenomenal, phenomenal business. So we approached 3M and we worked with 3M to get fantastic quality brackets, really good price point and um, quick straight teeth is now in nearly a dozen countries. And then from that, it kind of just progressed to teeth whitening and the teeth whitening, we looked upon it more as a cosmetic product rather than a sort of a dental product, made it look really sleek, really sexy and really nice. And uh, that one's grown out of hand. I mean, that one's, we're in over 20 countries now. It's uh, really busy. We have an Australian office. Um, and outside of dentistry, I do various things. We've got a software company and we do building and we do housing like every other Indian family I know. We do properties, building, lighting, selling, buying, um, anything to do with property. So this keeps me busy. I have three children and I have uh, one wife so far. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's very, very busy. So that tends to be what, what uh, fills my time these days. <laughs> well, I mean, definitely an impressive list of uh, accomplishments, Prem. And Thank you very I much. think for our audience to get perspective, I mean, you're not talking. This is what I find interesting about you. So you become a dentist and you go, okay, my hands are too big. I don't really <laughs> enjoy. Uh, being a day-to-day, -day, you know, what we would call a wet finger dentist here in North America. And so you decide to start buying dental practices. How many practices did you end up with? In total, ended up with 17. So it was a it was a good size group for the UK, not the biggest, um, but it was it was good. And I did it over a relatively short space of time by um generally um 
virtually bankrupted myself to buy what I could. Um, my <laughs> wife's also a dentist, so I took all her money as well. And um, and the kids in Hurtons and put it into dental practices, so it worked very well, thankfully. <laughs> but it's um, yeah, it was it was a good time in the UK previously. I mean, things have obviously progressed and things are more expensive, but it was um, it, you could see what was coming. You know, you could, prices were going to increase. You could see that there's a finite market there because in the UK, just give you back right back, you can't just open a dental practice. You have to apply to the NHS if it's an NHS practice, a government practice, and they have to approve the fact that you can open. And obviously, there's only a finite amount of money and a finite amount of need. So we're still drastically under dentisted in the UK, which is good. So there's still very good demand for laboratories. There's good demand for the dental work itself. You know, in, in the, I appreciate you sharing that because uh, a lot of people you know, may not have a, a perspective on the types of businesses you've set up. So here you are, you know, you're a young dentist and you go, I'm going to start expanding and you end up with 17 practices. And then a, a group of dentists or a, what we would call a dental services organization comes up to you and says, you know, would you like to, or we're looking for a lab that can meet our needs. And you go, I'll open one up. And I know a, a friend of mine, uh, Paul, ended up working yeah. with you. And <laughs> I mean, you, you guys were doing hundreds of units a day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it and, got, got real busy real quick. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is the, the part that I find really uh, Im impressive is the audience can appreciate that, you know, opening up one, two, three practices is hard enough. So you go and build 17 or buy 17 and put them together. And then you're running this and then you do a dental lab. And then I know for a fact you're do, you were doing hundreds of units a day. And well, it, it was stressful. It was, it was uh, yeah, it was, um, I mean, you know, it was, uh, it wasn't, there, there wasn't much time to do anything else. I mean, it's that trade-off, isn't it? With the, the I, I know you know you read all the right books, and it says, you know, you should work for this much, and there's balance, and you should do this. And you know, I read I read all those books, the books on business where they tell you that, you know, you should be capable of working this many hours, and you know, having a life in this many hours. And I, I'll be honest with you, I, I I I don't think it's realistic. I think there's times in your life where, you know, things things take precedent. And if I was going to give any advice to anybody. I would say, take the risks when you're younger, unmarried, no children, no assets to, you know, if everything was completely wrong, you bankrupt yourself, then it's the end of the world. You have got the time to, to dust yourself off and have another go. You know, it becomes a more serious prospect when you've got uh, wives, children and, and other businesses. So I think it's, it was very easy back then to be reckless almost, you know, dive in and have a go and see where these businesses go um it also makes you it makes you hungry and it makes you dangerous i think as a as a competitor it, it makes you very very untouchable i think that kind of attitude so you know you don't know it at the time yeah. but you're, you're you're not very careful and you just dive in and think i'm gonna have a go at this and and sometimes the gamble pays off <laughs> now and uh, you touched on a couple of things that uh I personally believe in. I mean, number one, uh, I did the same thing. I was 27 years old. I quit my job and said, I'm going to start the business and uh, maxed out all my credit cards to try and get it off the ground, you know? And I thought to myself, well, if I go broke, I'll still be around 30 years old. So yeah. I'll, I'll make it up. Yeah, that's your, when you're young, I'm that's what you think, right? If I lose oh. everything, I got enough time in the world I'll catch up. And the flip side is as you get older, you know, those you, you become much more conservative in the risks that you take because you, you've got responsibilities. Yeah. You you have to, so, but also do you not think there's a big thing when you start a business um as a young man? You know, you said you were 27, so that was three years ago for you, yeah. Um but <laughs> when, you, when you start when when you start a business as a young man. And you've got nothing to lose. 
that is a good position to start from. You know, you're, you're cautious when you've got businesses and a reputation and you've got, um, you know, you've got some money and you've got, you know, there's, you, you've got things that can go wrong. But when you've got nothing to, yeah. you've got no business, you've got nothing that you're going to lose. You, you, like I said, it's a very, it's a very empowering place to start from. I know a lot of people don't maybe see it that way because, you know, it's hard. You've got no money at the start and it's more difficult. But there are certainly some things which make you very untouchable, I think, about starting a business from that position. Uh, and and uh, the second thing you mentioned uh, is balance versus, you know, living your your passions in business. And I, I get a lot of people asking me about that. You know, how do you balance yeah. things? And I... My, my favorite term is I, <clears throat> what I tell people is I don't believe in balance. I believe in integration, you know, and how do you integrate all the things you like doing with the life that you have with family and friends and so on? Because by definition, if you're trying to balance things, it's inherently unstable. You're yeah. trying to, to spin so. a bunch yeah. of plates and keep them balanced, you know? Whereas if, if you integrate your life with the things you're passionate about, then you don't have to worry about balancing. Yeah, you know? it just... So it you just employed, you employed your sons so you could spend time with your family and run the business. That's <laughs> yeah. exactly what you did. <laughs> that's, that's the way it works. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, I, I mean, I, I know you have a very jolly, very casual uh, approach to life and... You know, I, I think it catches people off guard because they, they underestimate the the successes and in, in the entrepreneurship that you bring to the table. Is that fair to say? Yeah, no, I think so. And it's, um, I, I mean, I, I suppose it maybe touches on some of the things that we want to talk about later, the marketing. But one of the things I'll always say is I think it's got to be quite authentic. You know, the stuff that you throw out there whether it's the marketing or whether it's the way you run the business. Yeah, there's things about it that have to be serious. You know, you have to take certain things seriously. But it's, uh, you know, we, we, we only get one shot at this. And, uh, you know, there's times there's enough stress in it inherently. And I think you've got to try and have fun doing it. I mean, I'm the same as you. I love what I do. I have a lot of fun doing what I do. Um, there are days which are very difficult, very stressful. And, you know, um, there's but the majority of the time I, I think it's great it's fun and it, it is a, a very privileged position to be in especially what's just happened in the world in the last two years it's an incredibly privileged position to be in a business where people actually buy what you're selling and um and you, you're in a good place so i think more so even after this last couple of years i really appreciate what you know what's happened i have created that with myself and the people around me but I, I, I'm, I feel I'm very appreciative of, of what's there, very much so. And um, tell us a bit about how you approach these businesses. I mean, your your dental business uh, grew to be quite a large entity. Your lab grew to be quite a large entity. Now your whitening business is, I mean, taking the UK by storm and. You're now expanding to different countries with that. Uh, what drives these businesses or what's the formula that you've got to, to scale these things up? Do you know what? I, I, we were talking about this in the office the other day. And um, there's, there's one lady who has been with me for 10 years managing the practices and then managing um, the various businesses with me. And... Um, I think our approach has always been to um, employ people smarter than ourselves. You know, I, I, if I'm not one of the dumbest people in the room in my own place, then there's a problem. Um, so the lady that does our accounts is so much better at heading up the accounts department than I'll ever be. You know, I know what she does. I know why we do what we do. But the intricacy in the way she does that job, that's not something I'm able to do. You know, the guys that do the sales, they're phenomenal. You know, they go out there, they throw themselves into that job and, and more so than I'd be able to do. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, like I said, the, the lady doing the management, superb. You know, she does a better job of running the, the sort of the finer points of the business 
um, and, and the staff than, than I do. And I'm, I'm a broad brushstroke kind of guy. It's like, right, we need to do this. We need to sell a bunch of whitening. It needs to look like this. And then we need to do that. But then you need a team behind you to go fill in all the details and, um, you know, try and put, make some sense of the trail of destruction that you're creating and, and, and help you get it right. So I'd honestly say that the best thing you can do is to get a team around you that are, are better than you. They have to be. You know, you cannot be the smartest person in the company. You might be the driving force, but you, you cannot be the smartest person in there. You need better people than you. And how do you get them to join you? I mean, I see companies all over where, you know, you have one or two uh, people that drive the business, especially in small enterprises. And then the rest are basically what I would consider trainees in the job. So, I mean, how do you get these people to, to enthusi enthusiastically come, become part of your organization? I mean, the ones that we've I've had for a long time, they've they they're in here, they buy into what we do. And and most of it is same as yourself. Look, it's based on respect. You have to respect the staff that you have, uh, respect what they bring to the business. Um, you have to pay them. Unfortunately, I tried voluntary work, nobody, nobody was biting. Um, <laughs> you know, but I'd like to think we we pay well, we look after them well. Uh, there's a lot of pizza and donuts get drafted into that office. Um <laughs> And, but it, it, we genuinely try and put ourselves on the map as a company that's worth working for, that's of a size that is worth working for. And also, um, you, hopefully you've seen some of the stuff that we turn out in terms of the way we market, which I know you want to touch on today, our trade shows. It's a lot of fun. You know, the serious work goes on behind the scenes, obviously, like any company. But we do have a lot of fun doing it. We like our beer, we like our fancy dress, and we like to have, have a good time as well. So... That's usually uh, that's usually pretty compelling for most people. Yeah, and now that you've touched on that, tell us a bit about the things you've done at different trade shows. Right, that, uh, you know, <laughs> makes you memorable to to the audience. I don't know if we actually have pictures. I forgot to ask you to bring some pictures. <laughs> tell us oh, a bit about uh, some uh, of the this. Things. Is this this is the bit where we have fun. It, it started off actually once upon a time. With the lab, we started sending out um, giant, I don't know how we got onto this, but we started sending some people a giant African land snail if they sent us enough cases. I'm not kidding. It is huge. The shell is like this big. It's huge, great big snail. So we sent a few of those out, but they were as popular as they could be, as you can imagine. But by God, they got some attention. Um, that was, that was a, I, I have no idea what drinking session inspired that one where there was a lot of snails given out about years ago in the UK. Um, but then the trade shows, we ended up, um, the first one that we, we decided to do this type of marketing, uh, we got a camel, a, a live camel at the trade show. <laughs> and um, the, the slogan was, you know, have you got the hump with your orthodontic system? And have you got the hump with your whitening system? So we had this great big camel there, people taking pictures with it, because, I mean, they're a magnificent beast, you know. It's not something you see every day. And it went absolutely crazy on social media. And the sales it instantly spiked. I mean, we filled all our courses. We filled all our, you know, sales targets for the next three months were done in one week. We're like, this is, this is cool. You know, we had a lot of fun doing it. And obviously people liked it, so... And then the next year we went back and we had um, a samurai stand. So we got a lot of sushi. Um, I had dwarves because, you know, you have to have dwarves at a trade show. Um, so we had a little army of dwarves all dressed as samurai. Um, the stand itself was done like a, yeah, I don't know, I don't know a Japanese temple with gongs. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. So we had a samurai stand the year after we did a cave. So we all dressed as cavemen. We had a full-size walking T-Rex going around. Uh, we paid some guy to sit in that suit all day and walk around. And um, there's been, it's been just on and on where we do. And our theory is, you know, there's 600 trade stands there. How, how are you going to remember who you've seen? You know, you know, the, you know who's there. You know the big boys are there. But every single stand looks exactly the same. You know, nice and polished logo. And off they go. And then, you know, you get, I think you're not going to forget if you see, you know, a 
five meter high cave and us lot dressed as cavemen and T-Rexes walking around and dinosaurs being given out and giving out clubs and you get the idea. You know, it's, it, there was only one one show in town that day and nobody will forget that we were there. So that's what our marketing, and I know you've, you've started doing like um, the Dollar Shave Club type thing. And like we said, not everybody's cup of tea, but it, it, as long as enough people like it, it works so well. <laughs> well, and uh, I mean, it, it's a great discussion point because you're right. I did a survey before of uh, people leaving a trade show. And I asked them, what booths do you remember the most? And I put the list down. And uh, two of the five uh, booths in the, in the trade show weren't even there. I, I just put them on the list. And there wasn't really, you know, a, a, a consistent answer. In fact, people ticked the booths that weren't even there. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of yeah. funny to see, right? Because you're right. There's hundreds of, of people and, you know, everyone trying to, to promote their product in a very polished way. So your approach has been, how do I stand out? It, it works. I mean, I've got the utmost respect for all the companies, competitors, everybody in our industry. I really do. Um, you know, but it's an incredibly sanitized industry and it has to be because of the, um, the healthcare aspect. But to me, there's, there's, there's two sides to this business. You know, obviously there's the, the patient facing side, which obviously we do go into that arena, which has to be sanitized and it has to be corporate and it has to be clean. But then you've got the dental side, you know, majority of owners, whether it's the lab, the ortho, the whitening is obviously dentists. And, Paolo, make no mistake, you know, these guys spend five years at university, 75% of the time they're in fancy dress. The others, you know, they can barely remember the time from the drinking, the partying, the, you know, medics, dentists, vets, they're all the same. And as soon as we get out, we're expected to behave completely differently. So our approach was, let's just bring some of the fun back, you know, let's bring some of the some of the fancy dress, some of the fun times, you know, some of the drinking. Let's let, let's have a bit of a party about it because, you know, we, we, we're here for a good time, not a long time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and uh, I, I'm sure some people uh, frown upon your, your yeah. approach and some people, uh, you know, frankly admire you for the, the guts that you have in that approach. But either way, they remember who you are. I certainly do. <laughs> it works. It's, I mean, like we said just earlier, you guys got some of the negative comments about the, the Dollar Shave Club video. But I told you there's a good friend of mine in the UK because we did, um, we did a particular trade show. And it was, it, it, it was, it was loud. I mean, it was, it was even by our, by our standards, it was a little wild, this one. And um, we got a bit of a backlash on social media the next day. And uh, so I went with this guy, a friend of mine, and I said, oh, man, you know, I, I think we cooked the goose this time. They may be too far. And he said, look, at the end of the day, he said, "There's, you know what you do is very polarizing. And the people that don't like it, they were never a customer. They were never, ever, you could do anything. They're never going to buy off you anyway. They're never going to be a customer of yours. So whatever they say, it doesn't make any difference. And for the other people that, that love you for this kind of stuff, well, they just love you a little bit more today. So, you know, they, they're like, that's exactly why we use these guys. Look at this. So, you know, as long as there's more people saying that they, they love what you do than, than don't like, then you're winning. So, but it's like I was saying to you earlier, I think as long as the it's non-offensive, obviously, that's important. And I think as long as it's authentic, um, it works. And this is why we were saying, I don't think, uh, you know, the other companies can just go out there and say, right, you know, why don't we go get a dinosaur? Because it's not what they do. You know, that's not their personality. And it will look like, they'll be like, why have they got a dinosaur? This time? You know, this is, this is how we do it. This is what we do. This is how I like to operate. 
And I think when it's like that, it is infectious and people do buy into it, hopefully. And that's kind of what we bank on when we when we do our marketing. Yeah, I think you touched on a couple of points and uh, I totally agree with it. Number one, authenticity is important. It, yeah. I mean, people can tell you or can see that you're a direct reflection of how you market. That's who you are. And, yeah. you know, the second is, you know, who your customer is, you know, and a lot of people try to be all things to all people. It doesn't work. Yeah. You know, it it's work. not efficient use of marketing dollars. And I'm the same. I know who my customer is, you know, and uh, I'm happy to do my the best job I can for the customers that uh, are attracted to us. And for everyone else, well, you know, the world is a free <laughs> place and they have other options, right? And that's exactly it is. You can know this important that, that, that people do, they, they often forget what you just said, that it, you cannot win with everybody. And, and if you try to, it is a waste of time, effort, money, you know, concentrate on the ones that, that love what you do. And, um, you know, there's enough business for everybody, isn't there? So I've got a slew of questions now that I wanted to touch on, uh, you know, before we get into uh, some of the other things that, that we're going to talk about. So uh, oh. one of the first ones was the dentist, the lab owner, how did that end up happening? I think we touched on that. You know, it was basically... Uh, a DSO knocked on your door and said, we're having problems having a supplier. And you said, I'd supply it, you know? Um, yeah. Oh, it was a, a complete flying by the seat of our pants. It was, a, they said, you, you look like you know what you're doing and we need a crown under 30 pounds. And we've got whatever it was at the time, 300, 400 clinics. Can you make this happen? I was like, absolutely, I can make this happen. Without any idea of how we were going to make it happen, but that was that was genuinely how we started that business. Well, and I think people in North America have uh, no appreciation for how tough the lab business is in uh, the UK when it comes to discounting and NHS, where the the crowns that are covered by the government. I mean. They're yeah. selling for 30, 40 pounds a crown, which is, yeah. what's, oh, yeah. I, I don't know what the, but that's like 49, $50 per crown. No, no, I think you're in about, what, you'd be talking maybe 40, just over $40, maybe $42 yeah. maybe for, for bonded and maybe 70, $75 for an Emax and a Zirconia. Those are the kind of numbers so, you've got to make it work on the NHS. Yeah, and, and that's mandated by the government reimbursement policies and so on. Well, so, they're paid, the dentist is only paid a set amount for that type of work. Gotcha. So obviously they need to, they, they, it's not a lot, it's not a lot. I mean, they're, they're working under some very difficult conditions. So unfortunately, the, the pressure passes down to obviously their suppliers, such as those providing laboratory work, that you know it squeezes the prices because they're not being paid very much to do a crown. That's the bottom line. There, yeah. there's not enough money in it for for them to pay a lot for this type of work. Got it. And then, uh, did your experience as a clinician help you in the lab world? Yeah. What do you think? That's one of the Defin questions. Uh... Definitely. I I'll tell you where it helped. Um, it, you you know you set your stall out as a clinician. So as a dentist. You know, I, I know people that were happy just doing the government work. You know, they do the NHS work. They don't want the pressure of doing big cosmetic cases. They're quite happy just doing regular, good quality, everyday dentistry, family dentistry, you know, and that's fine. And then you get obviously some people that set the store out and say, no, I want to be the best dentist I can. I want wall-to-wall, -wall, fantastic, you know, veneers, Emacs crowns on every tube. I want to do a fantastic job of doing some really lovely cosmetic work. Now, as a laboratory owner, I think you, you've got to, again, set your stall out and understand which side of that market you're going for. I mean, we've got some wonderful labs in the UK, like um, we've got Beaver Dental, Tony Knight, and a few of these guys who you guys probably have even heard of over there. Their work is exceptionally good. Um, and 
you know, they these guys are good guys. They're not threatened by what we do because um, they, you know, they're, they're doing crowns for two, three hundred pound cost to the dentist, and it's absolute arc. We service a particular contingent of the market, which and we know what price points they can operate at and can operate a practice successfully at. It's easy to say to a guy who's got five dentists, well, why don't you just pay, you know, why can you not pay 45 pounds per crown instead of paying 30 pounds? Yeah, they could, but <laughs> that means one less person on reception. It means not having an assistant manager. You know, it, mean, it, it means having less staff in positions that would impact the day-to-day -day running and efficiency of that business and, and the enjoyment they can then get out of that business because they're paying more. So, yeah, from a, lab, from, a, from a dentist perspective, I understand their costings very intricately and, and what is a sensible price point for them to be able to operate a business. Now, uh, here's another question. And you mentioned you started buying up dental practices at, uh, you know, what, one times uh, earnings or one time EBITDA. that 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 about right? Yeah, one to two times um, EBITDA you were paying. It was crazy. And, uh, so what are practices worth now yeah. in the UK? Hey, oh, single good practice, you can get anything up to six, seven times. If you uh, get past the million pound profit mark, you can be looking at nine times, ten times. It's gone. Wow, it, so that's a... Yeah, it's gone crazy. It's a gone ten bagger on your... Uh, on your practice, as I, I, I sold, as, uh, I sold just there. before I got to the 10 mark, but we, we did nicely out of them. I mean, they were going up. And up. We, we had a lot of corporates that started consolidating the market. So obviously, when you've got big players coming in, buying everything, the price just keeps climbing. So they've really driven the prices through the roof. And, and you know what? Interestingly, through the pandemic, this hasn't dropped. It's still going up. Yeah. And what did you see? I mean, so 10, 12, 15 years ago, there's a bunch of dentists in the UK, much like there was here. And none of them or not many of them were seeing the opportunities that, that presented themselves. What, what did you see that they didn't? Oh, I, it was the sheer desperation to get out of drilling teeth. <laughs> It was that is, and I mean, it was a desperation. It was, uh, like I said, I wasn't particularly good at the job either. And, and you know, it's a very long day when you're working on people's faces that you and you, you, you know that maybe this, this is not what you were designed to do. And, and quite honestly, I was working, um, privately to start with. I bought a very small practice, which was just myself. And uh, within the first six or eight months, another practice came up. And I'll never forget this guy. He was a fantastic guy. He was at one of the brokerages in um, the UK. He was called Paul Newsom, And he had a small practice, NHS practice come up, government practice. And he said, come and buy the practice. And I looked and I said, well, this is really cheap, you know, one-time profit. And this is what I'm going to earn if I buy this practice. I said, this is too good to be true. You know, like, uh, this, you don't get deals like this. And he said, trust me, just buy it. So anyway, I bought the practice and I was earning more from that practice, which I didn't set foot in, than the one I was slaving in five days a week. <laughs> so obviously in my head was like, right, I need to just go buy 10, 12, 15, 13, you know, 50 of these, these things and I'll never have to do this again. So that was where my rationale came from for buying. Were you ever involved in driving patients to your practices or you let your team do that it was uh i mean for the nhs places it's a given that you're busy it's um there's not enough nhs or government provision in the uk so um for the guys over there some some of that some of the patients they don't pay for their work so you know if they're if they're on various benefits and whatnot they get free dental treatment and for everybody else it's heavily subsidized so you you're busy when you do a government practice you're busy now for the private ones, um, this was the, the one where I really, where we went to town on it, I opened a practice in, uh, and again, it's in line with the, how we market. Um, we wanted to open a big practice and, and I wanted a really big private practice. So I opened one and, and 
I, I bought several practices and moved them into a church. And I mean, it was a, a proper church, stained glass windows, steeple, absolutely sensational place. So we had a 10 surgery private practice in the church. Now, I'm not sure how big your average practice is in the USA, but 10 surgeries private in the UK, that's a big practice. That's a very big practice. Uh, and that did really well. That, that was a, a, a fantastic location. And, and it's the it's that whole thing, you know, if you've, it, we did a lot of implant work and a lot of cosmetic work. And the theory there was if you've got the money and somebody says, you know, where are you going to have your implants done? Are you going to have it done at the practice down the road? Or are you going to go to the great big, you know, 20,000 square foot church with stained glass windows and steeples and clock towers and all the rest? You, you're going to the church, you know, you so that did phenomenally well that place. You know, he's got to, you've got to make a statement at the end of the day, guys. I mean, I read somewhere we're bombarded over 10,000 times a day with online billboards, radio, you know, tens of thousands of times in any given day, you're bombarded with some form of marketing message. Um, you know, and, and you've got to stand out. If you don't stand out, how can anybody even think about using your services if they can't remember you in amongst all that noise? Yeah. Well, I mean, we've got a few other questions here that uh, uh, I need to answer and or I'd like for you to answer. So uh, here's a curious one. Honestly, what are the drawbacks we heard that it takes a big toll on your health and mental health. Is it true? I guess uh, to, to the person that's asking this question, are you asking about entrepreneurship in general, whether it takes a, a big toll on your health or not? Or uh, So I'm going to assume that that's the question, you know, having all these businesses and everyone, when I was growing up, people would tell me, oh, you know, being an entrepreneur, that's hard. That's... Uh, you know, it's stressful, so on and so forth. And I mean, what do you think? Has it taken a toll on your health and mental it's, health and physical health? I would say it's, it's a difficult one to... I'm not sure. It's, I think if you have a stressful job, yeah. But like I said, I'm very much like you with this. I do enjoy what I do. Yeah, there's times that it's difficult, but without it being difficult, you can't appreciate the reward. So... You know, I save a, I, I even relish the, the hard times. So I, I don't mind that. But I think in terms of um, mental health, um, I don't know. It's a tricky one from the point of view of, I mean, I, when I look back, put it this way, I, I wouldn't want to recreate what I did when I was 25 and 26 now that I'm 40. I, I you know, that kind of stuff, it... At the time, I didn't find it stressful, but I was, I was too young and stupid to find it stressful. It was exciting. I loved it. But when I look back at the money that I spent and the way that I, you know, behaved in trying to grow the business, it was, you know, I'd get the money in and I'd immediately spend every penny to buy another practice or another property or a, and, and I'd take every penny I had and pile it in and with no thought to the fact that, you know, I'm still going to run this business next week and the month after. So I don't know. I think I think there would be stressful times if I did what I used to do, um, but I think I bypassed some of the stress by not being smart enough to know at that point that I should have been very out of my skin. <laughs> I, <laughs> I should have been panicking out of my mind, and I was I was just enjoying the ride because I actually didn't know any better at that point. So and, and thankfully, like I said, it, the nicest thing, guys. I mean. You know, we sat here talking today, and I, like I said, I'm very grateful because I've had more wins than losses. But, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. And Paolo has got to be the same as you. You know, there's been, there is a lot of losses, but nobody ever sees that. They only see the wins. I mean, you know, we sit here today and we talk about things that have gone successful, and you can give advice and say, hey, look, do this and do that. But, you know, there are losses along the way. There are difficult days and difficult times. But as long as the the wins outweigh the losses, then, uh, you know, you get to write your own history, I guess, don't you? Which is the way it always is. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll i give this this uh, gentleman a perspective, right? 
Yeah, in in any sport, any business, there are people who burn out and get stressed out, and there are people who are on the other way that are, are actually quite successful and and are, are able to to do things and have more fun at it. So I can only speak from my experience. I'm 27 years old, and I decided that I'm going to go into the lab business, and then. At 28 or 29, I started exactly like your story, buying up dental labs. And uh, at that time, you know, labs were same thing. They were relatively cheap. And I said, I'll buy them. The uh, parents were retiring. The kids didn't want to go into it. And so I ended up over a period of nine years buying 50. And... Mm-hmm. After nine years, I we had about 2,000 people, full-time, part-time, you know. Uh, we had consolidated some locations. Some locations did well. Some locations went broke, you know. But overall, you know, it, it was a healthy operation uh, and was profitable. And what I found is in... 2006, when I sold that first company, so I started in 97, sold it in 06, uh, I didn't have anything to do. I'd show up at work and literally <laughs> had nothing to do. And I was actually kind of bored. And the reason is I was always, when I wanted to build my company, at that point, I did a chart of the organization. And I said, Here's the organization that I want to build so that I can control my life. And as we got to each level of growth, I would add a person for each of those roles. And for example, when we started at one point, we were buying one company a month. And I said, uh, I don't want to be doing this myself. I hired an acquisition team. And they were the ones traveling and buying all of these uh, companies. And then after they closed the deal, they put me on the phone and I'd be at home and I'd say, congratulations, you know, thanks for joining our organization and so on. And, and then, uh, yeah, I'd uh, have dinner with the, you know, the family and off we went. Right. <laughs> and so, it really depends on how you architect an organization. Yeah. And so th- to that person asking, well, he has 15 or a colleague with 15 clinics and had a breakdown. To me, that's a sign that there's no organizational infrastructure to support the clinics. And to me, that's the most important thing. You can get to one, two, three clinics on your own or one, two, three labs on your own. But at some point, you need an organizational infrastructure. And even the military, you know, if you look at the squad or, you know, uh, a group of individuals going out in the military, I mean, they have one leader for every eight to 12 people. Yeah. And then, you know, these leaders, once you get to eight to 12, report to another leader. And so the business world is no different. You can't Definitely. run and manage 300 people on your own. You, you are going to go nuts. You know? So that's my <laughs> two bits word. And that's, that's my experience. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, Prem in dealing with this, I'm probably the most incompetent guy in the room. And I'm <laughs> proud to be that. <laughs> so, um, someone else is asking, kind of off topic, but uh, on the whitening side of the business, Why do you need custom trays for bleaching kits? And like, give us a bit of a story on how you got into whitening. And I mean, right now, that's a multi-million dollar product for you. That's the biggest one. Yeah, that's the biggest one. And uh, so basically with the whitening, um, we prefer to take home whitening. um, And simply because um, no disparaging to any company, um, you know, but the, the in-chair uh, whitening, we feel is very transient. You know, you will get a result, but it will very quickly fade. Now, the custom trays um, are simply there because um, 
the better the fit of the tray, the better the whitening. And it's as simple as that because all the studies shows from, you know, Dr. Van Hayward, that the longer the peroxide stays on the tooth and the longer you bleach for, the better result because um, your saliva has what's called peroxidase in it. The peroxidase will break down the peroxide in the hydrogen peroxide. So you need a really well-sealed bleaching tray. And this is most of the problem. You know, the, the, if you get a good impression in a good laboratory, you get a good bleaching result. You know, most of the owners, is on the ability of the dentist to take a good impression and the ability of the lab to manufacture a beautifully, you know, closely adapted tray that stays in place that doesn't let saliva in, doesn't let bleach out, you get white teeth. It really is as simple as that. So but the, the custom tray is an absolute must in the whole equation, like literally non-negotiable. And I, I'm going to ask a quick question. Uh, we'll do a poll on what whitening brands people use, or uh, if you don't use whitening brands, which ones are you familiar with? Is it uh, Zoom, Opalescence, Ultradent, Core, and others? And, uh, you know, let us know just to give us an idea of where to take this conversation. And, and so you decide you're going into the whitening business, and obviously, technically, you understand I, I never knew that. I never knew that saliva, in effect, uh, interacts with the hydrogen peroxide and in, in the not and, yeah. so, and so, not only that, you were saying earlier uh, before the the webinar that uh, it's not about the coverage of the bleach, but also that the, the the teeth actually absorb, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean. Uh, bleach is not um, bleaching is not a surface treatment, and again, this is a mistake a lot of people make. Um, you know, the, the peroxide breaks down into oxygen ions, which penetrate the tooth, uh, which oxidize the stain, and it's the oxygen molecules and the penetration into the tooth that is the bleaching effect. So it's not a surface; it doesn't need to touch every part of the tooth. So, you know, the main thing is to keep the bleach sealed against the tooth. And that, that will give you the effect you're after. So, that, like I said, we subscribe to the, I mean, we are massively reliant on our lab partners in the UK to do a good job. And I mean, these guys do, you know, five, six, seven sets of trays a day now for us just in the UK. So, you know, from a lab owner's perspective, uh, the ability to increase the, the, the turnover of the practices you work with by, by getting them to embrace take home lightning with bespoke trays is a huge growth growth area uh, for a lab. Uh, and also, guys, you're talking about a, a five to 10 minute impression here uh, for the dentist, a set of pictures, and then they go away and the patient does all the hard work and then comes back for a review and some pictures. You know, I know what it sells for in the US, but you're talking in the UK, a dentist can earn the equivalent of seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars an hour just from taking impressions for bleaching. So, you know, for as a lab, if you can facilitate that and, and help these guys, and we've written some eBooks, which are really handy for how they market and how they maximize the amount of take on bleaching they're doing, especially alongside their orthodontic work. Um, you can increase the turnover of the lab significantly by doing what is a very simple procedure in bleaching trays. Excuse me. And, uh, um, <laughs> I, I think our poll didn't work, uh, you know, one way or another, we, the data didn't come through in our, our automated polling, but uh, I did want to post that if anyone wants to learn more about uh, whitening or ask Prem any questions, you know, let us know and we'll connect you with, uh, with Prem and his team. Uh, and it doesn't have to be whitening, it could be anything in general. I, Prem's very generous with his time, as, as you can see, and always happy to help people around. Well, if anybody's got an email, we can happily send you across the eBooks that we've written. We've got two, very short, easy to digest. One is on kind of the, um, the science of bleaching, and the other one is on the marketing of specifically uh, bleaching um, in the dental surgery. So anybody's interested, you can more than, more than happy to email you um, a copy of these across, not a problem. And I know we're hitting the top of the hour, so 
a couple of last questions. Um, first, for anyone uh, who's interested in more information about the evidence, uh, I'll, I'll ask the evidence team to just pull that up and let us know if you need us to get in touch with you. Uh, and here are the questions. Do you own Ashford Orthodontic Lab? Someone's asking. Is that no, yours? no, that's not mine. That was um, a big a big group that has emerged in the UK called ALS. They look very good, very interesting, very well run. And they've started buying some laboratories. Now they bought Ashford. Oh, but they okay. do my work for Chris Tooth, which is my ortho company. Your ortho company is called Quick Straight Teeth. And yeah. uh, just for clarification. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, what can the lab in the UK charge for trays? They, uh, they charge to a regular dentist, they charge £48 a set. So for you guys, I don't know, what's that, 60 65 $70 for a set of trays. Um, we get them significantly cheaper when we do them as part of the boutique package. Uh, but that's because they do, like I said, anything up to 700 sets of trays a day for me. So it's uh, significantly cheaper than, than that. <laughs> 700 sets of trays that's a day. We have topped wow. out on seven, 700 sets a day they're doing on average. It's, uh, it's gone crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, and here you are, you're jolly, you're enjoying life. I get it. It's stressful. I mean, uh, I always tell people, you know, you're an entrepreneur when uh, you start to feel the bile in your stomach going up to the back of your throat. <laughs> but, you know, some people are built for that. Some people aren't. Do you have any parting uh, advice for the people that are watching you today when it comes to, you know, marketing their practice or clinic or products? Yeah, I mean, like we said, I think the main thing is for to keep it authentic, make sure it's an extension of your personality and what you do, because people will buy into that, the right people, like we said, the people that, that are your fans will buy into that. Everybody else doesn't matter. They were never going to buy off you anyway. Um, but in terms of just the general approach to the business and life and everything, I'll tell you which one I always really like. And you'll probably know this one, Paolo. There was a, a, quite a famous speech, I think it was about 30 years ago, a guy called Brian Dyson, he was the CEO of Coca-Cola at the time. And he did a really nice speech. And he said, all of us are juggling five balls at any given time. Uh, work, friends, relationships, health, and spirit. And he said, you know, at any given time, you're juggling these five balls. The one, the one for work is made of rubber. When you drop it, it'll bounce. But with friends, relationships, health, spirit, these balls are made of glass. When you drop them, they scuff, they get damaged, or they break completely. So I, I really like that analogy that you put forward there. And when we do what we do, we try and look at it in those five sort of areas and, and just try and make sure that we try and put a tick in the box, you know, maybe not every day, but certainly, you know, those, those five areas of your life need addressing from time to time. And um, it's just important to remember, like we said, that the work one is made of rubber and you can always get it back. Everything else is, uh, everything else damages a little more easily. So that's just our general uh, philosophy on everything. <laughs> well, in, in uh, great advice, Prem, you know, it's been uh, an honor and a privilege to have you on this morning and thanks and for staying Thank up and, and taking time for us. and. Uh, you know, I wish you all the success, man. I really Thank enjoy so having you and admire what you're doing. So take care, Prem. Be safe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paolo. A pleasure. And to everyone out there, thanks for jo joining our show. I uh, really appreciate, especially a number of you that we see watching every week. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, you spending uh, an hour with us. So. On that note, be safe and have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, hey there, guys. It's Mike from Evident. You've probably seen our stuff before and wondered, what the f*** Evident? What do we do? Well, that's a great question. Our main job is dental CAD design. Still wondering what makes Evident so special? Well, the best labs and dentists choose Evident to turn their scans into bridges, crowns, aligners, and veneers, and more every single day. 
be more than just a number. We'll build a CAT team around you to make your digital dental treatments better by design. Go digital with the cool kids, start rolling with Evident, and let's get the digital party started.